Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. Hey, you're listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Mark Minga. And I'm Rira Yu. And we're here today to discuss our April 2021 book club pick, How to Pronounce Knife by Suvankam Tamavangsa. I had to practice that name a couple times because my Lao pronunciation is non-existent. But uh, it's a collection of short stories about the Lao immigrant community. And yeah, I'm excited to talk about um, this book with you, Rebecca. But before we get to that, uh, you got your second vaccine dose this week. How are oh, you doing? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm feeling much better. Um, we were actually supposed to record this episode a couple of days ago, but um, I got my second shot. And unfortunately, I had low blood sugar when I <laughs> oh, no. got my second shot. And um, I tend to have, I have a fever prone body. So I get a fever very, very quickly. So, um, I think like within two minutes of getting the shot, like I I got really lightheaded and I almost passed out. Yeah. And the nurse was like, uh, you're not driving back home. You need to <laughs> call someone to pick you up. And I was like, that is that is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because they sit you down after you get your shot for 15 minutes to see if you have that reaction. And most people don't. I got my second shot a couple of weeks ago and my reactions were pretty mild. Um, but yeah, I'm glad uh I'm glad you were able to get back safely. I got a message the day before we were set to record this episode with a, yeah, it's not happening tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's like, <laughs> nope, not happening. Um, most people were telling me, oh, like, you'll feel terrible for a couple of hours, maybe for like a day. But like the next day, you'll be fine. And then day two rolls around and I'm like, I'm in a fever haze. My fever hasn't broken I'm taking like NyQuil because like my fever is not going down. (laughs) And then day three, like my fever finally broke. But um, when your body is fighting a fever for that long, you're exhausted. And that was the day we were supposed to record. And I was like, oh, nope. Like (laughs) glad that I canceled the day before because I'm I'm not in the right headspace to talk about this book. (laughs) Well, I'm Made glad. sure to get that shot after my birthday because <laughs> I did not want to feel terrible on my birthday. It was not going to happen. Oh, I'm glad you're okay and happy that you're vaxxed. Um, only two more weeks until you can actually go out and do stuff. Not that there's much to do right now. Did you hear about people making fake cards so that they can like go out into the world? I mean, uh, when I go out these days, um, I'm still stressed out because i'm looking around and trying to decide if i can trust the people around me yeah it's like a real life version of among us 
It's like <laughs> which <laughs> which of you guys are actually vaccinated and which of you guys are just uh, terrible people who just want to get drunk and don't care about the rest of humanity. Yeah, and what happened to washing their hands? I was in the restroom and like two people in front of me totally did not soap up while washing their hands. That's disgusting. Uh, this is why we can't. Hum- have nice human things. beings disgust me. I know. <laughs> well, good thing we have a feel good book to read this this month. Yep. It was a good book. I enjoyed it. But it definitely was not a a let's feel good about humanity type of book. I don't know. I feel like there were some optimistic and humorous stories in this collection. Yeah. But they all had a touch of like melancholy to it. Um because well, I mean, we'll talk about it in our discussion, so let's just get into it. Um our I guess compulsory spoiler warning, we're going to be talking all about the book um how to pronounce knife. So if you have not read it, um, and don't want to be spoiled on storylines and themes, um, um, go ahead and read it now and then come back and listen to our discussion. Um, but with that out of the way, um, let's get to it. Uh, Rira, why don't you introduce us to the book, How to Pronounce Knife? The stories that make up How to Pronounce Knife focus on characters struggling to find their bearings in unfamiliar territory or shuttling between idioms, cultures, and values. A failed boxer discovers what it truly means to be a champion when he starts painting nails at his sister's salon. A young woman tries to discern the invisible but immutable social hierarchies at a chicken processing plant. A mother coaches her daughter in the challenging art of worm harvesting. In a taut, visceral prose style that establishes her as one of the most striking and assured voices of her generation, Tamavangsa interrogates what it means to make a living, to work, and to create meaning. So at the top, like this is a story, a collection of stories about the Lao refugee diaspora and laos is a country i think it's adjacent to vietnam but it's not southeast asian like block um that was it involved is, yeah. in the the vietnam war and because of that we're the source of a lot of refugees along with vietnam and cambodia that came from that area in i think the 70s 60s 70s yeah it was like uh the 60s and 70s uh laos is the only landlocked uh country in Southeast Asia. Uh, Like you said, it borders Vietnam. It also borders uh, Thailand. And uh, it is also the most heavily bombed country in all of history in terms (laughs) of uh, country size and population. Um, And most of that is from Americans. And a lot of the bombs that were dropped, uh, not all of them have detonated. So every year, there's a lot of casualties uh, from these from these bombs. Uh, so, yeah, Western colonization and uh, <laughs> meddling has definitely. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely part of America's dark history, and. I think there was a, I think it was either a film or a documentary about um, the unexploded bombs that came out that ran the festival circuit a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was called The Long Walk. But yeah, it was about, I mean, there are people out there whose jobs are to find and disarm like the unexploded bombs that still litter the, the country. And yeah, it's, uh, it's really fucked up. A lot of things that America did to Southeast Asia during that time was pretty like, it's pretty bad. It was war by proxy. Yeah. Against, you know, Soviet Union versus uh, United States. and Communism um, versus capitalism. Yeah. And also just, I mean, like the the bombing of Laos and the struggle that happened there, we call it the secret war because no one knows about it. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure a lot of our listeners who are listening, uh, you've probably haven't heard about Laos or you know almost nothing about it. I think that's like, pretty common amongst Americans, considering that our geography and history knowledge is not great. Um, But I'm really glad that we were able to read a book by a a Lao immigrant writer. Yeah, Uh, Suvan Kham was actually born in a Lao refugee camp uh, in Thailand uh, and was raised and educated in Toronto. Um, Both of her parents are from the capital of Lao, uh, Vientiane. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Probably not. Uh, They escaped by a bamboo raft, and they were sponsored um, by a Canadian family. 
and that is how they came to the country. Yeah. So you know, we talked a lot about geopolitics of the 70s in, in this intro, but this book isn't about geopolitics. It's not about the war. It's not about escaping. It's about the refugee immigrant experience. And I really like the plethora. Like there are like, what, 14? How many stories? There's, right there's 14 stories. Yeah, 14 stories and all kind of taking a different perspective. But all coming from this place of like alienation, of like displacement, and this kind of melancholy sense of like Southeast Asian refugees from this era are all people who lost their country, right? They're untethered. Like we talked about this when we talked about the sympathizer um, by Viet Thanh Nguyen all those years ago. But like these are literally like displaced, unmoored, untethered people that are trying to make a new life in a country that may not actually want them there. Like countries like America and Canada brought these people in because they felt responsible for their plight, but not necessarily because they wanted to or because they were feeling nice, right? Yeah, a lot of the families that sponsor uh, these refugees, they're doing it for not so generous uh, motives. They're doing it because it makes them feel better or for tax breaks or whatnot. It's never really uh, out of the goodness of their heart. Um, and I really like the fact that this book, uh, it a lot of the characters in this book, they're nameless. Uh, the places that they are at are also nameless. Uh, so you get the sense of, uh, as a reader, you get the sense of being displaced because you have no idea where you are and who the people are in, in the book. And uh, also just the fact that most of the characters are uh blue collared workers working these grunt jobs and that's like the opposite of what we know as like the asian immigrant story right like they come to the country as refugees you work hard and you study hard and you get to a point in your life where you can deem yourself successful and none of those characters are that i mean the people depicted in this book are the people that are forgotten and erased when we talk about things like the model minority myth, right? Like when we think of the stereotypical Asian story, like the model minority, you're not thinking about people from Suvan Tham's book. You're talking, you're thinking about people like from our families, like myself and Rira. Oh, yeah. right? <laughs> but the thing is, we our families that our families chose to come to this country, yeah, rather than fleeing their country to to survive, and that's. You know, that experience is often uh, used in media to, I, I don't know, like, um, there's like an inspirational factor to it. Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, like, aspirational, it's like, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just like, oh, they went through so much hardship and they, they <laughs> came out alive and they're so inspiring. But um, all they focus on is their trauma. And with this book, there's a lot of humor to it. Uh, it's really unexpected. And uh, yeah, there's like a lot of laughter in it. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite story from the collection? Um, I have a couple of favorites, but I think it would be good to start off with the very first one, How to Pronounce Knife. Um, it definitely, I, I could definitely relate to it <laughs> as uh, someone who like immigrated to this country when I was three and uh, had to kind of like learn English by myself. Yeah, that's different from my experience. Because my experience, I learned English and Chinese at the same time. Like I learned Chinese from speaking to my parents. I learned English while watching television, namely Sesame Street and all those kids shows. But I mean, I was also, I was born in Toronto. So I grew up in in the West, I guess you can say. Yeah. Um, the thing, the thing about like knife, that word does not make sense at all because, you know, you, you see the K at the very beginning of the word and it's, it's there. But for a lot of immigrants uh, who don't speak English, you know, like it doesn't make sense to them. And English is a very difficult language to learn uh, because it borrows from so many other languages. It borrows from uh, German, Latin, um, like a Slavic. <laughs> so when you are not a native speaker, there is a lot of unwritten rules. Um, and for a lot of children of immigrants, it's up to them to learn. And um, in in a way, like correcting your parents seems kind of wrong. Um, and 
what I liked about the first story is that you have the child protecting her dad because her dad mispronounces the word knife as knife, and that is the way that she was taught. But when she goes into class and she's doing the reading and the teacher is not letting her move on until she pronounces the word correctly, um, she's kind of protecting her dad's integrity, um, telling the the blonde white girl <laughs> in class, like, like, how dare you uh, say that my dad is wrong? Um, and then when she goes home, she doesn't correct her dad either. Yeah. I mean, I had a couple of thoughts about this story as well. Number one is it was refreshing to see a child of immigrants stick up for her parents because the typical reaction or like the stereotypical or I guess the, the most common reaction that we read about, right, is the child becomes embarrassed for the parent. And that's something that I've definitely felt with my parents sometimes growing up. Like, I regret it now, but, you know, it's definitely a feeling that happens, right? Whereas in this story, the girl's like, no, fuck you. My dad says this is how it is, so this is how it is. You know, there are words that I mispronounce uh, because that's just how I learned it in my house or I learned it by myself and pronunciation uh, English pronunciation is hard because sometimes like when you read a word, it's like, oh, like things are silent, like knife. Yeah. Uh, and to be fair, there are certain sounds in Asian languages that are impossible for the Western tongue to pronounce. Like case in point, my last name. My last name is Yue. And that U-E sound, no one can pronounce it unless you know the Chinese word. Right. And I mean, both of us even have trouble with you know, trying to pronounce Lao names in this book correctly. Right. And it's just language is, language is hard. Like, for example, the Oscars uh, this past weekend, <laughs> uh, you had filmmakers who, like, English is not their first language. And um, I forgot who it was. It was a French filmmaker, I think. Um, when he was doing his acceptance speech, he said, oh, my English is not very good, so bear with me. And it's like, I think people should be able to do their acceptance speeches in the language that they're comfortable in and not have to apologize. But that is usually uh, the mindset for a lot of Western countries, right? If you can't speak English perfectly with a perfect accent, with perfect grammar, which is still impossible for a lot <laughs> of Americans, by the way, um, you are kind of seen as, you know, like yeah. less than. Take a page out of Bong Joon-ho's playbook and just get yourself a translator whether you need it or not, because that man can speak English, too. <laughs> One of the words that I grew up with and mispronounced all the way until college was receipt. And it was the same thing with knife. Uh, the P is silent in receipt. So oh. throughout my entire life, I called it receipt. Uh, because when you learn English by reading, no one says the words out loud and correct. I might still call it receipt. See, now, so there's now like that I think about it. <laughs> there's there's receipt. Um, I mispronounced salmon for the longest time. I oh, wait, that's a word no one pronounces. Correctly. Like I pronounce it like salmon for <laughs> for like twenty years of my life. Um, alo uh, in Korean is aloe, so I've always called it aloe. <laughs> but I got like made fun of by like my classmates once so is it a low or aloe i think it's a low like really? in english hmm. but i still hmm. call it aloe because of <laughs> of habit but there you yeah. go right like language shouldn't be policed in my opinion i think accents um i don't know there, there's something beautiful about accents and there's um i don't like there shouldn't be shaming on people who can speak Two languages, maybe imperfectly, but they can still understand and do the work yeah. in their second language. And I think our generation now is coming to terms with that of like, let's not shame people for not speaking perfect English. You know, I want to believe that. But for some reason, I'm still, I, I don't know if that's really the case. Maybe it's just the people we surround ourselves with um, have become less shitty over the years. But I don't know. I feel like kids are still pretty mean these days. I But I feel <laughs> like with parents, because you and I are, um, you know, like we're we're older and a lot of our friends are parents now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
like they're not going to tell their kids like, oh, you can't speak uh, Korean. Like you need to like forget that in order to assimilate. There, like, there is more of an understanding that being bilingual is not considered a curse. I want to believe that as well, but I also know a couple people who. Who are you hanging out with? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just we're in a bubble where we celebrate like bilingualness. But I, I'm, I mean, there are countless people that I've met from like the Midwest or the East Coast or outside of you know this SGV bubble that that you and I live in now that, you know, grew up hating the fact that they're not white and never learning the language. And now there's no language to pass on. And I mean, some of them feel regretful about it. I want to reclaim it, but some of them don't like some of them have bought into it. I mean, that perspective is also covered in a later story in, in this collection. Um, the one with the, um, the mother, uh, which one was it? You are so you are so embarrassing. Which so covers embarrassing. the bizarre version of this first story, which is about a a mother whose daughter rejected her because of her foreignness. Yeah, and like names become a pretty uh, big theme in this book. Uh, not with just that short story, but also a short story with the Lao wedding invitation maker. <laughs> um, we we've seen this trend of. I guess it's not really a trend. I don't want to call it a trend because I hope it stays. But uh, you'll notice on book Twitter, a lot of Asian authors now have their Asian names written next to their handles. And uh, we've kind of come to a point where we are um, correcting people more on how to pronounce our names correctly and (laughs) uh, being a little bit more proud to uh, show our Asian names and uh, refuse anglicizing it and um you kind of you kind of see that in this in this book yeah i uh the the wedding invitation maker story was one that i really enjoyed um it ends on a bummer but um the story itself um the universe would be so cruel um had like the most dunking on white people in it which i thoroughly enjoyed i like the fact that like the the invitation maker by virtue of having a business could use his like what power he had to like dunk on customers that he didn't like, mainly rich white people. Yeah, and it, like it did end on a bummer. Um, but I think the theme of love is very consistent throughout this collection. You know, whether it's uh, you know self love or uh, failed romantic love or familial love, it, it is like very consistent throughout this the, the collection and it was really heartbreaking that the father like instead of telling his daughter like your <laughs> your husband to be was a bad person it had nothing to do with you not being enough or us not doing enough um so yeah like you see a lot of family loyalty in this collection whether it's the child protecting the parent or the parent protecting the child yeah, I mean, family was a big theme in many of the stories, um, whether it's love between or not even love. It's the relationships between parents and children or between siblings. And there's a lot of commentary also on like gendered relationships, right? Like between husbands and wives and what they're expected. And yeah, you'll notice that a lot of the um, like it, throughout the stories, you have pretty strong women characters and a lot of the men uh, featured are either uh kind of like resigned or uh in the background and um the stories that were told from the child's perspective i those were probably my my favorite ones uh there's something about writing in a child's perspective that lets you uh explore vulnerability more uh because children are more innocent and they are so trusting of their parents they believe that their parents are always right and uh, you throw them into displacement where they have to like learn all of these social cues that no one is able to teach them. And um, like, it's something that I went through a- as a kid, pro- like definitely not at the level of these characters, <laughs> but um, it's something that, you know, resonated with me. And I'm pretty sure it resonated with a lot of not just Asian immigrants, but also like like any type of immigrants, like Latinx or like African immigrants, uh, where you have to uh, figure out these 
unwritten rules that no one will teach you. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the things that all the families in the stories um, share is that they're real scrappy. They're willing to do whatever it takes to take advantage of what little opportunities or advantages that they have. And a part of that is I'm reminded of um, a section from T. Bui's um, The Best We Could Do um, graphic novel where she was talking about refugee instincts, like living every day as if you'll lose everything tomorrow and like kind of not expecting much from your life. Right. Like a lot of like a theme from a lot of these um, stories involve parents telling their children, don't expect too much out of life. It'll only let you down. Yeah. I Be mean, like, we'll let you have. Um, you, you see that in uh, Manny Petty with Raymond and his sister, uh, his sister telling him, like, don't dream too big. <laughs> like, don't dream that you're going to be able to get with these rich clients. Um, like, where where the grunt work, no one is ever going to pay attention to us. And uh, but at the same time, Raymond's like, don't tell me not to dream. Like the fact that I'm able to dream means that I'm alive and that's worth something. And uh, that is a very optimistic message. And yeah, yeah, with a lot of the trauma and a lot of the bleakness, it's balanced out with um, with optimism and uh, hope in, in terms of you shouldn't be hopeful, but at the same time, you're still going to hold on to hope because that's all you can hold on to. Yeah. I mean, regardless of what their past was, they're in a situation now where at least dreaming or hoping is possible. You know, it might not be easy, but it's possible. And that's different from like, you know, you and I, our families are maybe two generations removed from war. Like these, like the people depicted in this in this story are like one generation removed if that, or like not even one generation removed. So, I mean, that trauma is not, you can't even call it generational at this point. It's like, it's still personal trauma. Yeah. And with, with the Manny Petty story, um, I like the fact that Raymond is a failed boxer and it starts with him saying like, Oh, I, um, like he knows that he's never going to be champion. Like he's just a trial horse, a, a body to be beaten up uh, for for the next champion to to get to the next match. And um, but he's able to find redemption in this new new work. And even though it's considered menial uh, and and blue collared and ungrateful work, uh, he still finds some integrity in it like you do the best you can do with what you're given and yeah. you notice that a lot um for these stories like work is is a big theme like the quote-unquote hustle like how does that shape the immigrant experience and like you said like you there there's refugee instincts you live as if you're going to lose everything tomorrow and you're grateful yeah. for whatever you get. Not even that, but they're also all like, like it's blue collar work. It's work that you don't like it's work that people don't think about as work. Right. Because it's people doing service, like not even service jobs, like jobs servicing others. Right. Like I've never gone to get a Manny Petty, um, but you know, reading the story, like, I wonder how many people going in for their manicures and pedicures think about the people doing the work. Probably not. <laughs> not a lot of people think about them. And um, yeah, and like, unfortunately, for, for, for Manny Petty, it kind of delves into this a little bit, but like the dangerous work environment. And the cost of working in a nail salon where, uh, like, there's some harsh chemicals, it impacts uh, people's health, but you don't really have a choice. You just have to uh, keep working. But, yeah, like, for a lot of the work that the characters do, um, it's either their hard work gets ignored or they do work that they love, but the value of it isn't seen. Yeah, I mean, that's most apparent in the last story of the collection, Pick, Picking Worms, which, like, if that is not a story about mediocre whiteness trumping, like, hardworking people of color, I don't know what is. 
How yeah. did you feel about that one? Um, I mean, <laughs> we know that success is often tied to race. Privilege is tied to race and also colorism and class. And it didn't surprise me that um, you you have the mother who has a system of picking worms very effectively. And it's it's very weird work. Like you wouldn't consider it to be work. And it's menial and but she does it with pride. She loves it. And she teaches this 14-year-old white boy all of her techniques. And because he's doing it for free, um, and because he can speak English fluently, he gets promoted. A 14-year-old boy to be a boss of of a mother and also like other farmers who are like twice, three times his age. And yeah. He and it's just like they're and he wonders the, why like this girl won't go to the dance with him because p- apparently he feels entitled to like oh I work with your mom I I I'm nice to you so you I deserve your love I don't know like like the whole contributions of Im- immigrants being ignored and the yeah. rhetoric of immigrants steal our Im- immigrants are stealing our jobs where it's like no immigrants are providing a lot of good work into this economy but you <laughs> are mean, erasing their work i feel like that story it's kind of like a like a microcosm of like western colonialism right you have um this this guy with privilege who probably doesn't need a job coming to the farm, learning from the people working the farm, becoming their boss and telling them how to do their jobs, right? And taking credit for their work. Like that is that is like extractive capitalism, but in the form of like picking worms. Yeah. So that theme of privilege driving success, you see it <laughs> multiple times throughout this book. Uh, One story that pops into my head is Paris. Um, It's the main character is Red and she works at a poultry plant. And um, the women, one of the women there gets promoted to work at the front desk. And when she gets removed from that job because the boss's wife doesn't like the fact that there is like a an attractive young lady working in the front. All of the all of the workers that work in line at the factory, they're, you know, prettying themselves up. They're trying to like, you know, look their best to get that job. But eventually that job goes to a high schooler whose father works in the front office. And it's like, yeah, um white mediocrity <laughs> will always get ahead i think um the thing with short stories is i want to read like the novel versions of a lot of these stories <laughs> i feel like you know there's a resolution but it's not like i want to know what happens next right but at the same time it's meant to make you think about like okay what what happens from now like what does this mean a lot of these stories end on like very melancholy notes you know a lot of parents leaving their children in these stories a lot of spouses um, yeah. leaving their their significant other as well. And I guess you can see this as another survival instinct, right? Like a lot of embracing Western culture to survive, right? There's a story about the bus driver whose wife, um, I guess, starts cheating on him with her boss at the coffee store and like starts looking down on him for not being american enough yeah assimilation is a very big (laughs) theme in in this book um i thought it was really like it it was sad because the school bus driver has a name his name is jai which means heart in in lao and there comes a point in the story where the wife says no one cares no one knows that jai means uh, heart in Lao, you're J in this country, and English is the only language that matters. And it was just like, 
Yeah. Yeah, that hurt. <laughs> and, and like the fact that the like like Jai has a name, but the narrator calls him the school bus driver. And like it actually took me um because I had to read the story twice, but I actually thought that that character didn't have a name. And I was like, oh, no, I'm remembering him by his occupation, which is what happens a lot of the times when we think about blue collared workers. We don't think about their names. We think about the service that they provide us. Yeah. But um, there is one story that was lighter than the others. Uh, and it's actually like one of my my favorite stories, uh, Chick a Chee, <laughs> which was um, right. about trick or treating. Uh, I thought it was super cute. Uh, Trick-or-treating is an American... Like, I don't think the UK or Australia celebrate Halloween in the same way we do. No, I don't think so. I think it's a very American... I'm sure there was this, like, a drunk history about it at some point. But, (laughs) yeah, it's it's definitely an American holiday. And trick-or-treating is definitely an American pastime. And I definitely related to the story as well. My family definitely took us to nicer neighborhoods to go trick-or-treating as a kid. The end of that story was really cute because uh, the kids are bragging to to their friends at school <laughs> saying, like, we went trick or Uh Like, we went to this neighborhood and they were giving us candy. And the lunch lady is overhearing and kind of just sidles in and says don't you mean trick-or-treating? And the kids are like, no, it's chick a <laughs> Like, why are you, like, you're not even part of this conversation. Why are, why are you here, Deborah? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, it was, like a, it was like another example of, like, a child protecting their parents, you know? It's like, yeah. you're not going to tell your parents that it's trick-or-treating, that they're wrong. With chick a though, uh, I, when my nephews were here, they, they moved back to Korea, but they were here for two years. And the first year, um, my cousin wanted to take them trick or treating. And, you know, like, cause she was really excited about it. Cause in Korea, you don't have that. So, you know, she dressed up her kids in like these very elaborate costumes and, um, <laughs> they, they went to like a neighborhood where they can trick or treat, but her youngest son, who was three years old uh, at the time, he he was scared of all of the Halloween decorations, and he was like, <laughs> "No, like I don't want to go." And uh, but but it was like the the older son who was five, like he had a blast. Uh, he, like you know, this is not something that you experience in korea he had no idea what halloween was he was like why are people dressing up why are they giving candy why are there monsters i have no idea and i can't really explain that to a kid either it's just like i don't i don't know why we have this holiday i guess you know something to do with harvest moon and superstitions how do you explain that to a five-year-old yeah i mean i feel like asian holidays have similar creepy vibes to some of them too um, a lot of monsters and like giving offerings, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I've lived in America for like 35 years and I can't explain Halloween to you what it's about. It's about candy dressing up. It's like how parties. we can't explain why knife starts with the letter K <laughs> exactly. and we don't pronounce it. <laughs> exactly. It's just something you grow up with and you don't really question it. Yeah, that was definitely one of the, more, the most lighthearted stories. It was that one and the one about the the grandma or the great grandma teaching um, her great granddaughter about boobs, right? And sex. Yeah, but that ended in a downer. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the stories that stood out to me was Edge of the World. and. That was one of the stories where the mom um, leaves. Uh, she leaves the family. And there are just like parts of it that uh, were just so melan- melancholy. Um, like the fact that like her mom doesn't have any friends and the closest that she has to the closest that she has to to friends is are are the goodwill employees and it just reminded me how isolating 
um, it can be for for immigrants, especially refugees in in this country. Yeah, especially if you can't speak the language and you lose your confidence, you lose your your sense of self, and you know you start lashing out as well, right? That's why she, you know, that story included the narrator talking about how like she would accuse her husband of like stepping out on her because like of a missing sock or because he's working late but at the same time like he's also a blue collar worker who has to work extra shifts to support his family right and the way he uh copes with the uh condescending bosses at work was pretty funny him oh saying, yeah that, was that the one him with saying the... yes sir <laughs> he's like i say yes sir as if I'm saying fuck you to my bosses. <laughs> and I thought that was like such a creative and funny way to you know, rebel against capitalism. <laughs> uh, yeah. But just like that story was, it was probably like the most, um, it showed a lot of the Lao refugee immigrant experience. Like I, I would say like it portrayed the f- family of a Lao immigrant more yeah i mean like you said it portrayed the isolation of like a refugee immigrant because refugees aren't here by choice um they're here because they lost their homes and they had to leave and so it's not like there was a plan to come to the states and start a new life they had to they were dropped here and said good luck right so you know different people cope in different ways depending on what opportunities you have depending on how resilient you are to that kind of change right um like um there was the, um that other there was another story that had similar themes of like a mother trying to cope with a new environment and that was the um Randy Travis short story where um the mother just becomes obsessed with a country singer and like that becomes her tether to living in the states and I mean, I think that's also a story about addictive personalities and like, I mean, later on the story, she also falls into gambling debt, right? In, she into trade, gambling, She yeah. trades one addiction for another, a more destructive one, right? Like, well, I mean, both, both addictions involved her spending lots of money and inconveniencing her loved ones, right? Like she made her husband drive, what, like days to go to a Randy Travis concert? I thought it was really endearing that the husband tried, the father tried, uh, he bought cowboy boots, he try to to be the thing that his wife wanted him to be but you know he couldn't give what she wanted and yeah yeah do you feel like this book was much more um nicer to the dads than the moms i don't know because like a lot of the moms a lot of the female characters had a lot of personality to them That's you true. know like with manny petty you don't know you don't know the name of raymond's sister but you can definitely picture her. She has a lot. <laughs> she has a lot of personality, a lot of grit to her. And same thing with um, I forgot which story it was, but it was about the older woman who has uh, who goes into a sexual relationship with a younger man. I think that was Slingshot. That was the second story, right? Oh, uh, that was Slingshot. Well, yeah, and you you know you have an older woman who you know, accepts who she is and goes after (laughs) what she wants. So you have women characters who are very independent and can navigate their own uh, lives. They make their own choices. And sometimes that that their choices is to leave their family. And that makes it just sadder, I guess, because being a refugee means that family is all you have. Yeah, they're all you have, but they can also be a burden too. I don't think there's any examples in this book, but there's definitely real life examples where parents came together while coming to the States as a means of survival. Yeah, yeah. I think we talked about most of the stories on in, in the book, actually. I think the only one we haven't touched on is um, the gas station, which is about the, um, was she a CPA, the tax accountant? Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on that one? Uh, that was one of like the more forgettable stories for me. <laughs> I know a lot of literary critics uh, will disagree with me because uh, from what I've read of reviews, that was one of the standout stories in this collection. Mm. Um, and I can see why it it struck a chord with a lot of readers. Uh, you have a woman who thinks that she is 
unseen, undesirable, and she's able to have agency, I guess. I I don't know. I really don't have anything to say about the story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I'm like you. I definitely resonated more with the stories about family and about the immigrant experience. Um, I mean, that was a, it was a, it was a good read. I, I got through it. Um, I appreciated that she, you know, like, um, I appreciate that she was an independent woman that decided to, you know, make him miss her. I, I, I I'm yeah, make to him miss her. <laughs> yeah, because he because she leaves, she leaves, and you know he he says like I don't love you, and she's like, well, I know that you're lying. <laughs> Was there any story that you wanted to hear more from? More from? Um, I mean, we we haven't talked about this story a lot, but a far distant thing. It's about the friendship between um, two twelve year old girls. One is a Lao immigrant girl and the other is what i'm assuming to be a white girl uh they're both from blue collar families but uh the white girl's family is able to move up uh because the mom or the dad gets a promotion Mm -hmm. and at the end of the story um the lao immigrant uh girl who is now a woman uh, she works as a cleaner and across the street she sees her childhood friend And that childhood friend is now, you know, wearing a blazer with a pencil skirt and a suitcase. And you can immediately tell that she's done well for well for herself in her life. And um, and this is someone that she had a pretty strong bond with as as a kid. Um, You have like there was like a very special friendship between them. But she is hesitant to say anything, to to say hi uh, to her childhood friend because she doesn't want her childhood friend to pity her or to ask like, "Hey, how have you been?" Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I get and that's this like feeling... a shame that I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get this feeling whenever I see someone I haven't seen in like ten years. At, at this point, there I have, I have high school friends who I haven't seen in twenty years, and it's like. I don't want to talk about the last 20 years. I really don't. And like, I'm not comparing my experience to like someone who, you know, has to work cleaning houses, but that feeling of not wanting to like, of wanting to keep those childhood memories as they are, you know, as like fond memories. um, I totally get that. I mean, the, like, I thought what was really sad was her dad I mean, she still lives with her dad, but they still live in the same basement apartment. And what, where has her friend has uh, been able to move up in the world? Uh, the the Lao immigrant girl hasn't. And yeah. it's another commentary on like how race is tied with privilege and success. Yeah, I mean, this was the story where the dad told his daughter, like, you shouldn't be friends with that girl. Our destinies aren't the same. You shouldn't hope for too much, which is like a theme, another recurring theme that we talked about, right? And it's just sad that he ended up being right. And I really like the friendship between them because uh, there's someone in their building who's like a total creep who will say sexy as they were like walking past him. And I just thought it was really endearing that... uh, Like, they would be like, we're 12 years old, you creep. If you tell us that we're sexy one more time, we're going to cut it off. And, I mean, it's something something that I would see in, like, a dark indie coming-of-age film, which is why I kind of wanted that story to be a bit longer. Like, I could picture that being a book. Yeah, I mean, already it was one of the longer stories in, in in the collection, right? I think that one and Picking Worms are, like, Picking Worms, yeah. And Manny Petty were like the three longest stories in, in the collection. Yeah, Manny Petty. I wish that was a little bit longer too. <laughs> the thing with short stories, I, I, I don't think I am a short story type of reader. <laughs> um, I, it's you, you are left with wanting more, and that is the whole point of short stories. And I'm not for it. <laughs> I mean, you're left only more and you're, you're left with thoughts, right? You're left with, okay, there's a lot of content. There's a lot of like really beautiful writing and a lot of like very heartfelt writing in these stories. And I guess, you know, you and I, like, we're the type of people who like, after watching something, will like go online and search for like, 
spoilers and like commentary. Oh yeah, like we we're the type who <laughs> like after maybe watching all of the seasons of a show, will like go online and like look at the lore and <laughs> like <laughs> Um, yeah. same thing with games too it's like after like when you finish the main story of the game you go back and play all of the <laughs> side quests like you and I are the same in that regard so short stories oh no not I've really fin- our I've thing I finished the side quest before I finished the game so. oh yeah same same yeah. <laughs> here yeah but then there are some games where you have to finish oh, the main true. story to get to the side quest but yeah <laughs> like this is why yeah. I can never play the witcher because I would just end up playing it you for will never two finish years. It. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah. Any final thoughts on how to pronounce knife? Um, I thought it was a pretty good collection of short stories. Uh, like I said, I'm not a short story type of reader. A lot of the time, short story collections kind of let me down because it's always a mixed bag of which stories will I like? Which stories will I remember? <laughs> um, and I really did like Suvan Kam's uh, writing style. The prose was very sparse, but also like very exact. Um, and it just like dug deep into you. So yeah. I really appreciated her prose. I think it's one of those books where if people want to know more about like the refugee experience or even the Lao refugee experience like it's part of like now it's part of my repertoire of like here read these books right because it's a it's a it's it's a side of asian american history that is often erased in favor of i guess less downer immigrant experience stories or stories about immigrants in america like you know these aren't stories about people pulling themselves up from the bootstraps and chasing the american dream these, these are stories about people who had to come here to make a life and succeeded in doing so, but aren't necessarily doing well. Yeah, and it's part of the Asian American experience that gets swept aside. Yeah. And I like the fact that it isn't about just trauma. You see people who are living their lives and they have a lot of laughs and uh, the trauma that they experience, they are able to spin it into into like a fun story um you see that in in the short story edge of the world where a bunch of the lao immigrant dads are saying i like i was on a bamboo raft for like five (laughs) days and you know they're trying to like one up each other on their tragic stories and the more tragic it is they laugh harder and um, yeah, so I just like the fact that it normalizes the refugee experience and that it's not just all doom and gloom. Yeah. Well, tell us what you thought of How to Pronounce Knife um, Stories by Subhan Kam Tamag Bangsa um, on our Goodreads forum or let us know on Twitter um, at Books and Boba. We always love to hear what our listeners think about our book club picks. But on that note, that does it for our discussion of How to Pronounce Knife. Uh, Thank you for sticking with us. And I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as we enjoyed this book. Um, Rira, it's May. It is the Asian month. It's Asian Ah. month. (laughs) Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Uh, 2021 is upon us. Um, What are we reading on this most momentous of months? Uh, We are reading The Silence of Bones by June Her. This book has been on our TBR pile for I don't know, two years now. I, I think, think ever since we learned about it because you've been Oh no, excited it's been a year. This. It came out it came out in twenty twenty. Why does it feel like it's been a really long time? Well, I feel like we announced the publication like n- back notice, in twenty nineteen. Yeah, like a long time ago. And even then you were pretty excited about the story about it's about like women detectives in like Imperial era. Uh, it's Korea. during the Choson dynasty, so that's 1800 Korea. Mm. And uh, the main character is a Tamil who is an assistant to the Korean police because uh, because of Confucianism, uh, there's a lot of segregation between men and women. <laughs> and uh, because the uh, policemen can't go into women's spaces to do their investigation you have tamos doing oh. a lot of the work for them but they're considered lower class so lots of classism lots of sexism um i haven't seen a historical mystery novel that's set in korea before which was why i was really excited for this book 
And、uh, June Her actually came out with a new book this past month、uh, called "The Forest of Stolen Girls," which is also an, a historical Korean <laughs> novel. So she definitely has a brand, and I'm excited to dig into the Silence of Bones. Yeah,、um, we'll be discussing this book at the end of May, so y'all have a month to read and catch up.、Um, the book's been out for about a year now, right? So. It、should be widely available on、um, your e-readers or your bookstores.、Um, if you do go to a bookstore, remember to、uh, be safe.、Um, but alternatively, you can also buy this book through our bookshop dot org、uh, portal.、Um, and if you do so, you support your local bookstores as well as the Books and Boba podcast, which we appreciate. You can check out our bookshop, which includes lists that Rira has painstakingly curated. By going to bookshop. dot org slash shop slash books and boba to make your purchase today, and yeah, Rira, congratulations again on your full vaccination, and、Yay. happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. We'll see y'all next time. Bye.、Right, bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu, and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba, and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba dot com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop dot org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba dot com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Seven years. Has, has it been that long? Uh huh. Oh, uh, I was on a fishing boat. Training. It's part of the plan. Pla- what training? What plan? The, 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 the third season of the Korean drama podcast. Okay, we're doing this again. Well, okay, but there's no body switching in this one, right? No. The only thing we're switching is the fact that we're going to watch a good drama this time. From 2020, called Itaewon Class, a story about starting a restaurant and a dish that Koreans love called revenge. I thought you were gonna say kimchi jjigae. I thought you were gonna say juk. Those two, Koreans love those two. Listen to the Korean Drama Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective.